Hey everyone, this is Steve with another episode of Keep Em Rolling. And, you know, to be frank with all of you, um, the last week has kind of opened my eyes. You know, I've been doing these videos back to back and I've come to the conclusion that I, I just, I don't have a lot more to share with all of you. Um, I've gone through a lot of my big things and, you know, this is something I've been thinking about for a while as far as, do you reach a point in your life that you decide to switch hobbies? And I've been toying around with this, to be honest with you, for a couple of months. And I think doing these back-to-back -back videos has kind of made me realize that maybe it is time to switch. And I have a kind of side passion that I've been working on. And I'm going to move to that. Um, I'm not going to take down the videos that I've put up already. but And, and you're all welcome to follow me on my new channel. And um, my new channel is going to be Beanie Babies. And we're going to call it Beanie Baby Bonanza. And we're going to talk about all the attributes of collecting these wonderful stuffed creatures. So, everybody, April Fools. I figured, you know, I had to do something that would kind of, uh, you know, break all the seriousness that seems to be out there. So, hope I didn't panic anybody. I am not, just for clarity here, I'm not starting a Beanie Baby channel. And just so you know, I do have a Beanie Baby in my room, but it's one that my mom found me at an antique shop. And she liked that it was camouflage, and she knows I collect military. So, she's like, oh, I got you a Beanie Baby for your room. So, uh, he just kind of lives down in my room now as a mascot. So, no worries. Well, what are we going to do today? Today I'm going to share with you an item that I think is pretty cool. And once again, this is meant to illustrate why it's important to do your research and to, you know, study items, to look up the names and so forth. Uh, you know, I, for a long time, had a rather extensive collection of B4 suitcases. And the B4 suitcase, or B4 bag, as it's known, is the suitcase that was used by flyers. That seemed to be the group that used them predominantly, although other branches did use them. But flyers seemed to be, uh, the Air Force, if you will, seemed to be the predominant user of the B4 bag. And I had, oh, probably five or six of the things. In fact, four of them I acquired at a flea market in one kind of bulk purchase. The problem with B4 bags is they're just not highly sought after. <laughs> they're, they're something, they're, they're rather large, they're awkward to store, um, they... You know, unless you find one that has artwork on it, because some of the guys did really cool artwork on their B4 bags, um, they just don't hold the value. Now... What I find interesting about all of this is that, and this is what I want to kind of illustrate to you, um, is the value of items and, and how you determine the value. I had these B4 bags, and I went through my collection, and I picked out the B4 bags that I liked the best. I ended up keeping one um, is the only B4 bag that I have in my collection now. And I kept it because I just liked it, had a pretty cool name on it, you know, and I hadn't researched the name, so I'm like, I'm just going, I'm just going to hang on to this B4 bag. The rest I took to a military show to sell, put them on a table, and I had them listed. I mean, I'd seen them online going for, you know, $30, $40, dollars I put, um, I think it was $10 each on them. It was cheap, okay? And they were, they were in good condition. I mean, they were nice bags. Um, I had a, one of the uh, other dealers came around and he saw the bags and he asked how much I was um, listing them for. And I, I told him $10 each. I had the price tag on the bag and he told me I was crazy. He said $10 each is just way too cheap to be selling those bags for. You know, and it was almost like a lecture. And I think part of the problem is that when you take stuff to shows, you're going to have the guys there that are upset that you're possibly undercutting them. You know, they have something at their table for $100, and you have, you put that same item on your table for $50, you are undercutting them. You know, now if you all have that same item for $100, then someone's going to get $100. The way I look at it, though, is that I'm not there to display my wares. I'm there to sell items. If I'm going to get a table at a show... I'm taking things that I, uh, you know, found at garage sales, flea markets, things that don't necessarily fit into my collection anymore, and I take that money and I turn it into um, new things for the room. Boom, <laughs> new things for the room. Now, there's an old saying that at these shows you have two types of people. You have the people who bring items for sale, and you have people that bring items 
to sell. The people that bring items for sale are the ones who usually put up a beautiful table and have ridiculously high prices and don't want to negotiate. The people who bring items to sell are the individuals who are willing to negotiate, put reasonable prices and such. And the way I look at it is if I paid, you know, $15 for an item and I can sell it for $20, i have made $5. That's great. Uh, if I've had the item for a couple of years and have had great use out of it and I sell it for what I paid for it, that's, that's fine as well. You know, not many hobbies can say that. But I see time and again where a lot of the people that are selling bring items for sale. You know, I, I went to an event where they had a reenactor's sale time where you could put stuff out and sell it and it was designed for reenactors. So the idea was that I have three canteen covers I don't use. I throw three of them out to some, you know, five bucks each and someone comes along who's just starting reenacting and wants a canteen cover and can pick one up cheap. It wasn't meant for your high-end collectibles. It was meant for more of your used items, extra surplus, things like that. And I brought my stuff to sell. I mean, I put down a blanket. Actually, it was a shelter half. Put down a shelter half, and I threw all my stuff on it, and it was cheap. You know, dollar here, five dollars there. And the guys were going crazy grabbing stuff off my, my blanket, my shelter half. And in fact, a guy bought my shelter half. He was like, I need a shelter half. Would you, would you sell it? And I'm like, sure, why not? And I sold the shelter half. Everybody else around me, though, weren't, they weren't selling anything. And... It, the prices they had on the things were absolutely ridiculous, and there was no wiggle room. I remember looking at one item a, a gentleman had. It was a rather bulky item, and he's like, well, I've got like five of these at home, and I'm, I'm trying to, you know, get rid of them, and, uh, you know, I don't need five, so I brought one to sell, and I'm, I'm like, okay. And I said, you have $30 on it. Would you take 20 Nope, need 30 uh, Would you do 25 I'd be comfortable at 25 It's high. Nope, nope, 30 or no sale. I'm like, well, I'm not going to pay 30 for it. I'm sorry. I, I'd pay you 25 Nope. Watch the guy later loading it into the trunk of his car. And he'd complained how he had to drag this all the way down to the sale. It was a couple hours drive and, and he just wanted to get rid of this stuff, yet he wouldn't negotiate. He had also thrown out there the fact that he hadn't paid very much for the items that he had. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, you know, that's fine. Take them home. I don't care. Back to the uh, B4 bags. The dealer told me I had too cheap of a price on them and he came back later and he ended up buying them all and that was great you know saw him on his table and he had literally fifty dollars each he'd placed on these bags it was insane how much he was asking for him and i thought you know if he gets it good for him but i'm like i don't think he's gonna get that price because all around the room there were a couple of the guys that had b4 bags and they had that 40 to 50 dollars on them and sure enough at the end of the show Guess who was loading them up into his car to take home? And I happened to pass him. I said, enjoy the bags. You know, it was a good deal. And he's like, oh, I got all these home. I don't even know where I'm going to store them. <laughs> I'm like, why'd you buy them? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't get it sometimes. But that shows you the strangeness of how people price things. I don't know why we're talking about this. I guess passing some time here, really nothing else to do with uh, the current stay-at-home situation. So... Um, back to what I'm going to show you though, I kept one and I didn't really look at it. It had a name, very faint name on it. It was a Colonel and I just kind of let it go, you know, and one day I was bored and I thought, you know, I'm going to look this guy up just for the heck of it. I'm going to type his name in and well, let me show you the item and we'll tell you the story. All right, everybody. This is what a B4 bag looks like. The best way to describe it in modern terms, it's almost like the modern equivalent of a garment bag. Uh, you could hold your uniform in here. You could hold some other equipment. Um, it has a couple of compartments when you look at it here. You can see the thickness and the sides do bulge out because it's soft. So you can fit quite a bit in here. And... I'll open this up to show you how it works, but let's just kind of talk a little bit about how it looks right now. You have this compartment right here that completely unzips. It's a real sturdy, heavy canvas, real sturdy, heavy zipper. Um, you can see on the side here, we've got various information. This is where I found his name. And it shows up actually better on the phone than in person, which is interesting. So you can see we have, let's get the little pull out of the way. You can see Colonel, 
Joseph L. Laughlin, L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. And we've got his serial number and some other markings on here. I have not researched the markings, but um, the name clearly comes back to uh, a gentleman who is actually pretty famous. And we'll get over the, yeah, we'll get into that in, in just a minute here. Um, turn around and you can see the other side here. Same thing, Colonel Joseph L. Laughlin serial number that there's another compartment um what i've seen are uh, some guys would put their shoes and that in this compartment here because it's a separate compartment from the interior of the suitcase other gear underwear socks things like that could all be stuffed in here and then your uniforms and that could be put inside on the top you can see it's got a real heavy duty handle which is sewn in with these leather patches um you can let's see over here it's got the white stamp for U.S. Army Air Forces. Uh, it's got these kind of snaps on the side here to secure everything in. Because remember, these are the types of things that you either A, carry yourself, or B, you get loaded on a truck and then thrown into a hold of an aircraft or thrown into the back of a truck, etc. And you want it to be durable. You don't want this thing to bust open and uh, splay your entire worldly life in the back of a truck or in the hold of an airplane so they did all this extra stuff you can see how what's nice is this snaps if you lift it up it actually is supposed to snap the zipper so i can unzip this thing all the way and then the zipper handle part can be tucked up underneath here and closed off so it doesn't snag or get open so now who was colonel joseph l laughlin well i had no idea so I put his name into the uh, internet, into the internet. I looked him up online. <laughs> it sounds much better. And immediately it came up to the Army Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson. And they talked about having this exhibit of Colonel Joseph L. Laughlin, including a P-47 that they had painted up in his colors. They had some of his medals and some of his other items. And I thought, holy cow. So I began to dig into it. And without going into too much detail, uh, it was Colonel Joseph L. Laughlin. Uh, he was in the 362nd Fighter Group. Um, they were also known as the 362nd Suicide Outfit. Um, he became the... Uh, the group's leader, if you will, in August of 1944 and remained as the leader until um, the end of the war, 1945. What's interesting is during that time, he flew a P-47. Uh, his P-47 was known as 5x5, five five, and he scored the group's first aerial victory in February of 1944. He wasn't the leader at that time, but uh, he scored the group's first aerial victory. He shot down a BF-109. Later, uh, he actually was credited for sinking a German light cruiser, and I believe it was in the harbor of Brest, France. He did that in August of 1944. Uh, he had a couple other real memorable things that he did. If you go online and look him up, Colonel Joseph Laughlin, you can see the plane, you can see, uh, you know, stuff about him. Quite an interesting story, but it just goes to show you how there's this stuff that's out there and, you know, for the longest time, this was just a bag. You know, I think I bought this, I don't even remember where I bought this. That shows you how kind of uh, unimportant it was. I think I found it at a military show. Uh, maybe it was down, uh, I don't even know. It wasn't where I'm from, I know that. So it was down in the Midwest. Don't know if it was maybe Fort Indian Town Gap or something like that. I remember the cost of it was cheap as chips. It was like five bucks. You know, and it was like, oh, B4 bag, that's cool, I could use one of those. At the time, I was doing some um, Army Air Force or Air Corps kind of uh, reenacting, if you will, at uh, local air shows. So we'd set up equipment and wear the uniforms, and I wanted a bag that I could carry my uniforms in. And this one just called to me, and I used it for that, and not realizing that it belonged to this gentleman, which is, it's crazy. So I guess the whole takeaway from this is... In these times right now that we're in where some of us have a lot of extra time on our hands, instead of lamenting that you're not out finding things, which, you know, I think we all are. We're all getting a little stir crazy and would love to be out doing some antiquing and flea. It's coming into flea market and estate sale weather and, you know, out kind of seeing what falls out of the bushes. Take some time with your own collection. Look things up. If you have 
a postcard with a name on it, if you have V-mail with an address, if you have, uh, you know, letters that were written, if you have a diary, if you have uniforms with names in them, take some time, throw them into the almighty internet and just see what comes out because you never know. As I said, I did not buy this bag uh, for the name. You know, this wasn't one of those things where I walked in and said, ooh, look at that name. I know who that is. I got to buy this. Holy cow. I bought this bag because I wanted a B4 bag. Simple as that. And then, as I said, one day when I was bored, I was doing some cataloging of my items. You can see how I, I do my tags up here. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to look his name up. And, and that's when, boom, I hit pay dirt. So take your time. Look things up. Explore your collection. You never know what cool things are going to pop up. And it doesn't have to be someone at the top either. Trust me on this. I get just as excited finding out, you know, looking up a name and being able to find out that this guy lived in the town next door to me and became a, a janitor at the local high school, you know, after the war. It doesn't have to be that the guy was a general or the guy was a, a hero. Even for me, the common stuff is awesome. So take your time. Uh, let me show you the inside of this bag. Okay, this kind of gives you an idea of what that interior compartment looked like. It's got two heavy-duty zippers, so I can zipper it one way or another. And as I said, these zippers are super, super heavy-duty. Um, but this gives you an idea of, of kind of how deep and how much poof you can get out of this. So you could stuff a lot of underwear <laughs> into a compartment like this. Now let's open it up and I'll show you the inside of the bag. Okay, here's the inside of the bag. And we'll start up here. This is the top. And you can see there's this metal hook here. Normally, this bag would have come with hangers in it, uh, metal or wooden. I think this one would have had the metal hangers. And these metal hangers would allow you to hang the uniforms in the bag. And you see how it opens. It opens almost like a garment bag. If you don't know what a garment bag is, it's a suitcase where you can put your suits in without them getting wrinkled if you're going to a convention or what have you. Um, on the very... This would be the bottom of the bag, but there's a ring there. It's reinforced. So this is something you could hang up. So when you were in your quarters, you could hang this on a hook, and then this bag would hang open, and that way you could access your suits and so forth, or your uniforms. Um, once again, it would hang here, and it would pass through this. So the hangers would be under this, because this right here is a covering to protect your uniforms. Let me zoom in. It's got the nice, you can see the Army... Air Force's logo, type B4 bag, some of the nomenclature there, Canvas uh, Products Company. And this snaps down. So when you look down here, you can see it actually snaps into the corner. I've unsnapped it so you can lift it up. And then your uniforms would be behind it and protected. And then down here was extra storage. Um, you know, if your uniforms are longer, you could kind of stuff them down in here if you wanted to, or shoes or what have you. Uh, the case is reinforced when you look in here this is basically just to give it a little bit of rigidity so it keeps its shape uh this piece right here would actually go across once you had your uniforms in you would pull this down you would snap this into place and then this strap would go over and there would be another strap here with a buckle on it and they would buckle in to kind of hold everything in place unfortunately for some reason this uh this is the only half we have. We do not have the buckle half. It would have been bolted right in there, and it has since been lost to history. You can see the zippers on here, and they are just mega heavy duty. As I said, once you got the zipped closed, you'd bring both zippers underneath. This would snap over them, and that way they wouldn't snag and accidentally rip open the bag in transit. You can see over here the other, the other heavy duty zipper. It's a cool bag. You know, if you're someone who collects Army Air Force, this is a great way to go. Um, keep your eye out for them. They're out there. They're not expensive. Let me stress that. Unless it's something real special about it, uh, you know, an art artwork on it, or even this one here with the name. I mean, the name's cool. I could probably get uh, a little extra money because of that name, someone who wanted, you know, this bag. Actually, what I'm probably going to do with this bag is when I'm done with it, I'm thinking of donating it to Wright Patterson just because they have his memorabilia. So I would like to see if they want the bag, and then maybe it can become part of their exhibit or, you know, be used by them. 
but they're not that expensive. So don't go crazy buying one, but they are cool to have. So if you're at a military show, you happen to see one, you're an Army Air Force collector or field gear collector, what have you, this is something cool just to kind of add to your collection. Uh, make sure it's complete. Make sure the handle is intact. You don't want the handle to be ripped out. Uh, the zippers work. Check all the zippers. Make sure they open. Uh, I've seen some where the zippers have rusted shut and things like that. So just check it all out before you jump into it. Take your time. Take a deep breath. Look it over. But they are really cool. They are a really cool bag. And it's my pleasure to be able to share uh, one that belonged to a very interesting gentleman who served as a fighter pilot, and well, a fighter bomber, I guess, in the European theater. So, well, everybody, this is Steve with another episode of Keep Em Rolling, hoping that you're all doing fine, happy, safe, and sane, and that you remain that way. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. We're going to keep these right on uh, rolling along. So this is Steve reminding all of you to keep them rolling.